Hello world, it's Craig. Well, it turns out that this nibble code running on this SCMP processor in the nibbler isn't done toying with me just yet. Soon after doing the last video where I went through the fix for the bit seven bug in the gecko routine, I was in nibble minding my own business when the board threw this at me when I incorrectly used a statement. I wasn't sure if this was a baud rate problem or what was going on, so I put a logic analyzer to see what the little scamp was sending out. And sure enough, the logic analyzer was seeing the same thing. Everything looked good up until the last character of the word, which I would have thought should be an X, which is 5.8 in ASCII, but I was seeing a D8. So if the terminal and the logic probe were both seeing D8, I checked to see what did the processor mean to send out? And it didn't take long to track down the error messages. I just looked at the ROM listing for anything that I could read and hear the messages. Here's E-R-R-O and rather than the final R, here's this funny character with a value D2. Here's Sentex, S-N-T-X, but rather than the X, there it is with the value D8, which is what we were seeing on the logic probe. So everything's what it should be. At least the terminal is receiving correctly what the program is sending. It's just not a normal character that it's sending out. So a little more digging shows the problem. The error message handler uses the most significant bit as a flag to determine the end of the text, rather than putting in like a ETX byte 03 or some other flag. They've set the most significant bit of the last character in the word high. And then when they're outputting that word, the program looks for that flag to know when that word is done and it needs to fall out of that loop. And this isn't a problem when using a teletype because just like the bit seven error in Gecko, the teletype ignores the most significant bit. But with a terminal or a terminator, a terminal emulator, you know, here we are again, and this is a similar bit seven bug that's in the put C routine. Now this put C routine is called dozens and dozens of places in the nibble program. So this bit seven problem isn't the calling codes problem, it's a put C problem and it needs to be fixed here. So once again, we're faced with a block of code that needs to be patched without adding any bytes to this block. When the character is output, put C needs to set the most significant bit to zero to remove that flag on any characters that come in with that flag set. Now I'm gonna fix the bug in this video, but this time, as we fix the bug, we might as well start learning a little bit about the scamp itself and its assembly language. If you wanna just look at the bug fix, then skip ahead to this time on the video where we'll start talking about the bug. Right now we're gonna learn about this code. Remember the S in SCEMP stands for simple, but since this processor was so different than anything else I had used, it was becoming more and more quirky the more I read about it. And I wasn't making great progress learning until I actually started digging into the code to adjust the baud rate and fix the gecko bug that was in the last video. So that's how I'm gonna start presenting the SCMP and its assembly language from here on out by looking at the actual code. Now there's only 46 instructions and eventually we'll see them all and make them all make sense. To begin with, I presume everyone is familiar enough with assembly to know that in our source code, we enter these four columns and there's one instruction per line. First, there's the label if there is one, the opcode mnemonic, the operand if there is one, and a comment if we want to add one. Then we assemble the source code, either with an assembler or by hand assembly like I'm doing at the moment, and that assembler creates this list file that also has the two columns added to the left. The first column is the starting address of that instruction, and the second column is the machine code for that instruction and its operand if there is one. The next thing to point out is I'm gonna fill in the details as we need them. So some things I say may not be completely forthcoming. So for example, we're gonna start with this first instruction, the XAE instruction. And I'm gonna say the SEMP only has two 8-bit registers plus a status register. And that's only half truth because there are in fact four additional 16-bit pointer registers, but I'm gonna completely ignore those until we need to know about them. So let's get on with learning about this. The two 8-bit registers I just mentioned are the accumulator, called A, and the extension register called E. This first instruction exchanges the accumulator and the extension register values. So the instruction is logically XAE for exchange A and E. 
It's a one byte instruction, so there's no operand. And one thing you'll notice that is different about the code for the SMP is it seems very fragmented, and you don't need to hold one train of thought very long. And I think you'll see what I mean in the next few minutes. This routine, this put C, is about a dozen of these little fragments. When put C was called, the character to be sent to the teletype was in the accumulator. After the XAE, the character is in the extension register, and we don't know what's moved into the accumulator. The accumulator has whatever was in E when this routine started. There's only eight extension register instructions, and one of them is not a load extension from the accumulator. To get a value into the extension, we need to do this exchange. The next fragment is to create a starting delay for the teletype to catch up from whatever it was doing last. The code uses the delay instruction. The delay time in microcycles goes like this. It's 13 plus twice the value of the accumulator plus twice the displacement plus the displacement times two to the ninth power. On this scamp two, one microcycle is one microsecond. This means that before using the delay instruction, the accumulator needs to be loaded with a delay value. And this load immediate does that for us. And the value of the operand is just put into the accumulator. This delay value was for 110 baud, it was FF. For 2400 baud, our delay value is 0A. Then the delay instruction and its operand is that displacement value we just looked at in the equation. It was 17 and 110 baud. And that's the end of this little fragment. The processor will go off, do the delay, and come back after that delay is over. This is commonly seen three instruction fragment dealing with the status register. The status registers eight bits, and think of it as an IO port or as a command status register. The least three significant bits are the outputs of the processor's flag pins zero, one, and two. So whatever we write to these least significant three bits comes out on those three pins in the hardware. Flag zero is our transmit character for the serial port. So that's the one that we're gonna be controlling in this routine. Likewise, whatever the status is on the two sense pins on the processor is reflected in bits four and five. And sense B in bit five is the received data on the serial port. Now, normally that'll be a one when the received data line is idle and it drops to zero when the start bit comes in or a character has a zero data bit. Bit seven is the carry slash link bit is an overflow bit that comes from arithmetic is the interrupt enable flag, which is a setting that we control when we want the interrupts on. Just like a port or command status register, it's poor form to twiddle somebody else's bits. If this routine needs to change the flag zero bit, which is the transmit data bit, through the whole process, the program needs to preserve all of the other bits in the status register so they're unchanged when that value is put back into the status register. Now, nothing happens if we try to change either of the two sense bits. They will just revert back to whatever the sense input pin is doing. Now, the SEMP can't manipulate the bits directly in the status register. The status register needs to be copied to the accumulator with the copy status to accumulator or the CSA instruction. Then the program can manipulate the bits in the accumulator. In this case, set the least significant bit to one with this or immediate instruction with an operand of zero one. Setting that bit to one creates the start bit. The outputs are inverted on the board, and so setting that to one will set that line low. Then the new status is copied back into the status register with the copy from accumulator to status or the CAS. And you'll see the sequence everywhere in the code. Get the status byte, twiddle the bits, write the status byte back into its register. Next, the program is gonna enter a loop to output a bit. So the loop counter is set up by loading the immediate value in the operand into the accumulator with the load immediate instruction. This loop needs to output the start bit and then the eight character bits so the loop counter is initially set to nine. Then the loop counter is stored in this memory location called temp3p2. P2 is one of those pointers I mentioned earlier, but just accept the location operand as a given for now. This is just a memory location. Here's the label for the start of the output loop, put C1, and the loop begins with another delay. The accumulator and displacement values are set up like always. The start bit logic has been set, so the first time into this loop gives a one bit delay for the start bit. And the next instruction is a decrement and load with the memory location as the operand. As you might expect, it decrements the value that is in this memory location, 
and then it loads that new value, that decremented value, into the accumulator. And that memory location is the loop counter that we just saw, so this instruction decrements the loop counter. And then the next instruction then tests the result of that decrement. If it's zero, the program will fall out of the loop and jump down to the label put C2, which is where the program continues when all the character bits have been sent, and it sends the stop bit and then returns. Remember the output character is in the extension register. LDE creates a duplicate of the output character in the accumulator and leaves the original value in the extension register unchanged. So now we have two copies of the character. The next instruction, all of the character bits are cleared except for the least significant bit. And that's the bit that the loop is going to send out to the serial port. XAE exchanges the accumulator, so now the outgoing bit is in the extension register and the character is in the accumulator. The bit that's being sent in this time through the loop is safe in the extension register, so we're going to shift that bit out of the character. The SR instruction is a shift right, and this is a shift, not a rotate. A zero comes in on the left side of the accumulator, and the least significant bit just falls out into the bit bucket. Then the character and the output bit are exchanged so that the output bit is in the accumulator, and the shifted character bits are safe in the extension register. It's now time to output that bit. The program gets the status register in the accumulator, and now it needs to set the output bit, but it needs to set it to the opposite value since there's inverters on those serial lines. The way they do this is they set the existing flag zero bit to one, and then they exclusively OR it with the actual output bit. If the output bit was a one, exclusive ORing it with a one creates a zero. And if the output bit was a zero, exclusive ORing it with the one creates a one. So effectively, this, this inverts the output bit as needed to compensate for those output inverters. And once it's set in the accumulator, the new status byte is copied back to the status register, and that is the moment that those bits are set, and the value zero or one is now present on the output pin. The loop is finished setting that bit, so it jumps back to the put C1, where it does a one bit delay for that one bit. And when that delay is done, the loop continues with the next bit and so forth until all eight bits have been sent out. When the character output is completed and the loop counter is decommitted to zero, then the program falls out of this loop and then it's down here at the put C2 label. Here it gets the status byte again. It sets the least significant bit to zero for the stop bit. Remember it's inverted, so the line will actually go idle. And then it writes the new status byte back to the status register. This XPPC instruction then returns from the put C routine, probably back to where it was called. And then ignore this last jump at the end. We'll talk about that sometime in the future. So that's everything. We now understand this put C routine. Now let's fix the bug as that skip ahead crowd rejoins us in the video. The routine needs to clear the most significant bit of the character. The most obvious way of doing that is to start this routine with an AND immediate instruction with the operand being 7F. All of the character bits will remain the same except for the most significant bit, which will be cleared. If the character already had a zero there, nothing's gonna change, but if that flag was set, then values like that D8 we saw earlier will become 5A, which is the correct ASCII character. Now finding the bug was the easy part and knowing how to fix it was pretty easy, but now we need to make room to fit those two bytes. And like before, we have to do that without moving anything else in the nibble code or we will just break everything. So to see if this is possible, first we need to find any underutilized bytes. And in this little code, they are down here at the bottom. This CSA, the two byte and immediate instruction, and the CAS are to set the stop bit after the loop is finished and before the routine, routine uh, returns. But if we set the stop bit inside the loop, then we don't need these three instructions and that'll save us four bytes. And if we save four bytes, we need two of those bytes to clear the flag in the character data. So that leaves us two bytes to absorb the function of this stop bit into the main loop. Now who remembers that TV program called, you know, name that tune? I think it was the same name in the UK. Well, I can name that patch in one byte. Now, not only can we fix it one byte, but we can potentially remove the four bytes in that initial delay. But we only need one byte, so I'm only gonna do that. 
If we change the loop counter from 9 to 10, remember it was 9 for the start bit plus the 8 character bits. I'm changing it to 10 for the start bit, the 8 character bits, and now also the stop bit. Then we look at this shift right instruction. Shift moves a zero into the most significant bit. So if we ran the code now after all the character bits were sent out, the next bit would be a zero that was shifted in the first time it went through this loop. And to extend that, if we set the byte counter to 13, then it would send out the additional three bit times and it would eliminate the need for the incoming delay like I mentioned earlier. Now the problem is that we don't wanna shift in a zero, we need to shift in a one. So when it's complemented, complemented with that exclusive OR, it becomes a stop bit. To do that, right before the shift instruction, we set the carry to 1 using the set carry link instruction, SCL. Then, rather than a shift of just the accumulator, I change that to a shift of the accumulator, including the carry slash link bit. Now, rather than filling the left bits with zero, they're being filled with ones, and these will become stop bits, and we can add as many stop bits as we want just by increasing that loop counter. And then finally, to get the addresses to match up with the original code, since four bytes were cut, but the patch only needed three, one of these four is just replaced with a no-op instruction. Now, looking at the output of the logic probe, this used to be D8, and now we can see the X rather than that graphic character that we were getting with the D8. But note that the baud rate is a tiny bit off because the new code is more efficient than the old code. So if I put the existing delay into my little spreadsheet with a zero overhead, it says the delay itself is 273 microseconds, but we're seeing a 422 microsecond bit time. So the overhead in that loop is 149 microseconds. Now if I put 149 microseconds as my overhead, we can see it matches the 422 overall bit time. We need the bit time to be 416, so that's six less. And the delay is twice the accumulator value, so the new value needs to drop by three to 127, which is seven F and hex. And I put in that seven hex, replace the EEPROM, and now the bit time is spot on at 416 microseconds. Now back in our real term window, I can disable the bit seven ignore, and the error messages are just fine the way they should be. We need to remember that we left those four bytes on the table in case we ever need to come back and claim them in the future. It's purely coincidental, but if we look at the kit bug code, they add an extra test at the end of the put C to see if the user attempted a keyboard input while the character was being transmitted. However, if we look at their code, that would take us seven bytes, and right now we only have that one no-op plus the five that we could take out with that first delay. And I'm not sure I can squeeze two more bytes out of this routine. It only had 43 bytes when we started. So I've replaced the ROM files on the project page with this latest patch, and now we wait to see what else crops up. Until then, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and I will talk with you later. Bye-bye.